This video was sponsored by Canary. Stick around to the end of this video to learn about a special giveaway. Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Zach and today we're gonna to be talking about the unified namespace and specifically the data historian's role. We've done a lot of videos about the unified namespace. You can watch one here. But essentially the unified namespace, and we've got a lot to cover, so once you're done watching that, let's get into the data historian's role. So, but basically the unified namespace is it is the single source of truth for all data and information in your business. Um, the single source of truth. Rather than having multiple different data silos across your plant, you want to create a single source of truth. That is what we refer to as, and the industry refers to as, the UNS, okay? Unified namespace. It's also the place where the current state of your business lives. It's also the hub at which the smart things in your business communicate with one another. And it's the architectural foundation of your Industry 4.0 Digital Transformation Initiative. It's your digital strategy. Okay, how does this work? So versus uh, the legacy, the traditional way is to have Edge PLC, you connect to SCADA, you connect SCADA to MES, sometimes you connect MES to P, uh, ERP, but sometimes that's paper. Um, and then you have cloud up here at the top. Most time that's not connected to anything. Sometimes you're sending digital threads from here all the way up to cloud and you're missing all the context at every one of these layers. So what do we do? How do we solve that? Very simply, we take all of the stuff that's on the edge. Here's your edge, PLC and HMI. Remove this stuff. We take all the stuff that's on the edge and we publish that into a unified namespace. Same thing with SCADA. We use SCADA, we subscribe to the UNS, get all the tags into SCADA, and if there's any additional context that's created in SCADA, namely like alarms and stuff like that, publishing it back in. Okay. Uh, the other thing is MES, that's where it's going to get all the data, real-time data, right? You're not using a stopwatch, you're using real-time data to calculate OEE. You're using real-time data to calculate SPC for you quality folks out there, right? ERP, same thing. There's a lot of information in here. This is uh, typically, you know, your master data model. That's a little data database. This could be like your SAP, right? Typically, this is a big giant data silo, right? And IT won't let you touch it, right? <laughs> well, using the technology-driven approach, we're gonna publish that data into a unified namespace so you can get real-time data to the edge. Why do you wanna do that? So you can calculate things like real cost. ERP has all your costing information. Your edge has exactly what you're running on your lines. Using those two things in combination, you can calculate real cost. We're gonna not go into that in this video, but we're gonna go into how does this all play into the historian's role? Same thing with cloud. Rather than doing digital threading approach where you're creating objects on the edge, threading them all the way up to the cloud, missing all the context, what you do instead, take that data, subscribe to the unified namespace, and publish back in. Sometimes the unified namespace might live in the cloud. Sometimes it might live on the edge, right? You might have a little UNS down here. Unified namespace is everywhere and it knows everything, right? It's, it's omniscient and omnipresent. So unified namespace is really important. Now that we know that, let's go into where the historian sits. So uh, here's our historian. And we'll say we're using Canary. Why do we like Canary? Well, there's three reasons. Number one, it uh, supports the minimum technical requirements. We'll get into the minimum technical requirements in a second. Actually, no, let's get into that right now. IIoT minimum technical requirements. It's report by exception. Only data are only the changes in the data are reported as opposed to pull response. Edge driven. Connections are instantiated from the edge. We'll get into how that creates and it plays into scalability in a second. But it's important to note you're not going to the server to configure your new historian tag like you would with like let's say a Wonderware historian. Uh, let me know down in the comments if you guys are familiar with uh, you know adding a new PLC to a plant connecting that into your Wonderware Histor uh, connecting that into your Wonderware SCADA, then also having to go into your Wonderware Historian and define a new tag, point to the OPC source. You're having to, that's server-centric, um, that's driven by the server, server-centric as opposed to edge-driven. Uh, lightweight, it's really important. Uh, you don't have a bunch of extra uh, overhead in your payloads. Um, it's, it's really simple. What's, not light, what's lightweight? It's not heavyweight. I'm looking at you, OPC, uh, with excessive overhead. Last but not least, open architecture. Plays nice with everything, 
And it also exposes its internal data model to external consumers. Who is notoriously bad at this? Pi, look at Pi. They have MQTT for ingress, but they don't egress. They don't publish that data back to the unified namespace. Canary can both consume from a unifier namespace and publish back to a unified namespace. Why do they do that? Well, it's part of their business model. They're open, open architecture, plays nice with everything. As opposed to a closed architecture, let me consume data, but uh, you know, if I create asset frameworks in Pi, it's really hard to get that information back out to external consumers. They're gonna charge you for a connector, and even then it's not scalable, it's point to point. Uh, let's go into why do you need a new unified namespace? Real quick, so number one, scalability. We just talked about that. That comes from edge driven, right? And it comes from being lightweight. You're not bottlenecking your network. Uh, normalization, every event in your business passes through a single unified namespace and all the timestamps are uh, aligned. Um, why does that matter? It plays into machine learning and AI. It plays into to process analysis. You're, your operations analysis are gonna be looking at trends on like a, a historian client, like an Axiom client for using Canary, and they're gonna be analyzing that data, and if those timestamps aren't lined up, it does you almost no good, right, for root cause analysis. Uh, time to value. Uh, one of the most famous things about MQTT is it supports both structured and unstructured payloads. Why does that matter? Well, when you're prototyping, you may not always wanna shove everything into a square peg. If you have a round peg, you can create a round hole, right? Um, and then you can prototype really easily, figure out if your idea works or not works. Then you, can, then, you can norm, then you can standardize it and scale it across the enterprise. So time to value. Security. Number one thing that we love about this type of architecture, outbound only. Devices from the edge can publish their data out through a firewall with no inbound open ports. This is gonna make your IT team really happy. If you were, especially using MQTT, if you were using OPC UA, you would have to open inbound open ports for the server, for the server to pull the, the, the device and then it would respond with its data. So you have inbound and outbound open ports here. And MQTT, no inbound open ports. Outbound only. Last but not least, it gives you agility. It gives you ability to create new information models using um, your modeling software. We can take a look at uh, Canary has really awesome tools using reg reg regular expressions to model your data and create something kind of similar to asset frames. You can model you can create asset models in uh, Canary using regular expressions. Real quick side lesson on what regular expressions are. So here's uh, regular expressions. Canary gives you the power to create in, uh, asset models using regular expressions from your tags, wherever those tags may be coming from. Could be coming from OPC and a legacy system, could be coming from your unified namespace. But essentially, uh, let's say this is uh, your tag and you wanna model this type of a pattern, you wanna take anything that fits this type of a pattern. So this would, you know, if you, for whatever reason, had emails in your namespace, this regular expression right here would return all of the emails inside of your namespace. But using patterns like this, which I won't get into right now, you can return any, any type of format that fits this. Here's the ampersand, ampersand, you get the picture. So moving back, so these are the IoT minimum technical requirements. That's one of the reasons why we love Canary is because it supports these minimum technical requirements. Let's go take a look at architectures. So again, here's a unified namespace. Here's your data historian. What we're gonna do, we're gonna install MQTT connector right here. And it's gonna subscribe to the namespace and publish into the historian. Now, any changes in the unified namespace can be consumed into the data historian without having to make any changes in your data historian. Once you set up this connector to your namespace, all new tags can be consumed into your historian. But what if I don't wanna consume all tags? Well, that's what your regular expressions come in for, right? To not only tell you which parts of the asset model you wanna consume and store history on, but also to create asset models in the first place, right? This is my line, these are my motor types. 
Imagine being able to look at Canary and just select, I wanna see all of my motors in my system, or I wanna see all of my conveyor belts in my system. Let me take a look at all of the OEE values across all my lines, okay? Let's look at the enterprise architecture. So this right here is a Canary enterprise architecture, and if you're saying, hey, this looks a little bit like the legacy automation stack, you're right. Um, they support they support legacy architectures as well. This is like most manufacturers that we work with today. They have you know level five internet DMZ, and you still might have some of this, but um, you're not having so many firewalls with sender and receivers. This is not not really scalable, right? But it does support this type of an architecture. Uh, but essentially, looking at what we're looking at down here, we got field devices and sensors uh, connecting into your field controllers. Little side note, um, IO Hub sponsor a few months ago, Let's put an IO Hub here. They are creating a Canary publisher, right? So you can put an IO Hub on the edge and do your Canary publisher. You could send it straight to the cloud if you wanted to, by bypassing all of these firewalls. You could send it straight to your, uh, your control center. Essentially what this architecture is trying to show you is that they support both local historian Right here's your local canary historian, and here is your enterprise canary historian. Now, this if this looks a little complicated, let's move on to the IoT architecture. This is a little bit more simple. That's one of the reasons why we love the IoT architecture. It really flattens the stack. It creates not so many uh, parts where you're having to hand handhold and pass off data like like you would with like the Purdue security model with like three or four different OPC servers to get data to the enterprise. Here's real simple, right? Data source on the edge, have a data collector. Again, this could be like your IO hub, could be just a canary, uh, canary collector. Um, sending, it, sending it through the firewall into your receiver, stores it in your canary historian. Then you've got these views. These views are driven by your asset models inside a canary, right? And you don't have to define every motor, right? Again, you don't have to say, I have motor one, motor two, motor three, motor four. You can use regex to define your asset models. That plays into scalability, plays into agility, right? And then you got your views, right? Those are like views in SQL, and you can consume that data you know, from client tools on your mobile device or you know, local, you know, down on the plant floor using like a, you know, an Axiom uh, client right there. Or this could also be in your IoT platform. You can really easily embed your Canary tools inside of your IoT platform, uh, like Ignition. We've done that. Also, uh, if you're using frameworks, you also get a 500 free tag uh, Canary historian with every frameworks uh, unlimited package that you get. That's a that's a big value right there. Over on the right side, this is what I did, uh, showing how the unified namespace would play into this architecture. Again, so you've got your edge gateway publishing in, into unified namespace, and then you've got the Canary MQTT connector, which we showed before, going into the sender, sender to the receiver. This would kind of be like as if this was in the cloud. Um, this also, this firewall doesn't necessarily have to be there either. This, if you wanted to do like a local Canary historian, but essentially, same, same concept, Canary Historian right there. Um, here's your views, and then you can view down on your client tools on your plant floor, or you can view down on your client tools. So that's gonna wrap up this quick video on uh, unified namespace and the data historian's role. There's lots of reasons why you need a data historian. Uh, it's obviously for collecting your time series data. Remember, if unified namespace is the current state of your business, the historical state of your business, that's the role of the historian, right? There's also data lakes, which we're not gonna talk about in this video, but uh, remember, the value of like a historian is that it's purpose built for massive, massive amounts of time series data, storage, and retrieval. Um, you can store millions of data points per second to a canary historian, and you could pull those back over years and years and years of history. Not every data lake architecture, actually most data lake architectures, aren't gonna be optimized for that. They're gonna be really more optimized for like machine learning and AI. Um, so I'm not saying don't use a data lake, but I am saying use a historian, 
consider looking at Canary Historian. So that wraps up this video. And by the way, there will be a link down below to join the Canary community. The first 500 people to do so will be entered in a chance to win a free Tesla Cybertruck RC car and an Opto 22 Groove Rio. That's a, an amazing value. Uh, click the link below, join the Canary community. Thank you guys for watching this video to the end. And thank you Canary for sponsoring our channel in the month of October. We'll see you guys in the next video.